Hello everyone, it's Chaplain April. Uh, thanks for uh, being with me today and watching this video. Uh, this is going to be <clears throat> a sequel to the previous video. The latest video that was posted a few days ago is actually from last week, from a class that I was in last week. This week um, I am in ecclesiology, missions, I don't know, something. But for those that are new here, because my my YouTube is growing, so not everyone knows that I am in a Doctor of Ministry program at Southern Methodist University. I took some classes at Southern Methodist. It was through OCU um, 20 years ago now. I can't even believe that. But SMU always stuck with me. I loved the professors and everything, and so I was always drawn to kind of go back. Um, the reason I took classes is because I was originally going to get a Master's of Divinity and then it became too difficult for me. That's a that's a three-year Master's. That is a very long Master's. In, in, um, back in, in the time when I was going to do it, it was a 90-hour Master's. So anyone that has an MDiv, um, kudos to them. That is an amazing degree. Um, you can do a lot with it. And I switched from that to... I ended up going to Oklahoma State to get um, international studies because um, I, I had already done some chaplaincy and um, I wanted to incorporate the international thing. I'd already been a missionary kid and everything. And so I got a master's in international studies, which is kind of like inter you know international relations. Um, I wanted to go into the humanitarian arena and maybe work for the Red Cross or some, you know, organization like that. But I never, I never did that. Um, and I just came back to chaplaincy and not having the MDiv is hurting me. So um, that's how I came into this program. It's gonna allow, allow me to become board certified for chaplaincy and all of these things. I apologize, there is something that is making me sneeze here. I don't know what it is. Um, I have been getting an allergy shot once a week now after I found out. I don't know if I have, I have the photo of where they test you for your your seasonal allergies and they put all of these, um, they, they write out what shot they're giving you all up and down your arms. It's like 20 of them or 30 of them. And they just go one after the other and they they put a needle in you and they and then they see which one uh, yeah all of those it's just like boom 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 it's like oh my gosh to see what you're allergic to i was allergic to cedar pollen which is a very prevalent in the state that i that i live in so i have to get these weekly shots because um I have to build up like an immunity. I don't know. You have to take the shots for like four years or five years before you can stop taking them. So now I have to go get these weekly shots, but there are people that um, get two shots. And I've even seen some get three. Depends on how many things you're allergic to. If you're allergic to like, I was only allergic, well, maybe one and a half things, but it wasn't, um, the cedar pollen was the most. But if you are really allergic to more, you know, like multiple things, you're gonna have to get more than one shot. So I'm like, thank God I don't have to get two shots. <sighs> but now, so, but I haven't had the shot since I've been away. Uh, I have no idea where to get that shot here. So <laughs> I don't even know where I'm at in Dallas, literally. I mean, I went to, I tried to go <laughs> and do something, you know, just, a little bit different than class, you know, just kind of get out. And I thought I'm gonna go to Costco and there was a couple things I wanted to look at. So I put it in my GPS, it takes me to Costco and it ends up being a business Costco, which I didn't even know existed. So they don't have electronics and the clothing. It's not like the regular Costco. So I was so confused. And the lady explained it to me at checkout, and I'm like, oh, great. The one Costco I found is not the right one, so forget that. And uh, if it's not somewhere around SMU, then I really don't know where. I don't even know, like, exactly where SMU is situated on a map. So, like, I'm, I'm so lost when I'm here. I, I don't know. Um, 
because normally I just come through here when I'm going to see my sister in Austin. So I don't even really, I, I, I don't know. Um, thank God for GPS, but I am so turned around here. Um, this is the first time that I stayed at a place that was like on the other side of the campus. I'm normally on that side, so it's been very confusing for me. Anyway, so um, I'm feeling like all this drainage, like when I talk now, um, because of this allergy that I'm having right now today, allergic reaction or something. So here's some of the notes that we had from last week, or, or these were um, things that our professor gave us. I don't remember what this was. It says image of vocation and leadership from the faith and leadership website. I was talking about this last time. Um, and I wrote down here where deep gladness and the world's hunger meet. Okay, somebody said that. And then someone said you can have multiple callings. So here's our schedule for deep day two, detailed version. So we were talking on day one um, on prophets, what they are, blah, blah, blah. He used a lot of Greek. He went into the Greek a lot, that professor did. Each, each class we've had a different professor. So this is my sixth class now, and each time it's a new professor that we hadn't had before. So each professor has been very different, very unique. I mean, all of them are amazing. I mean, I'm just amazed um, at them. And this professor obviously studied Greek. I never took Greek because I didn't do the MDiv. Had I done the MDiv, then yes, I would have had Greek, maybe Hebrew, and a lot of other things that I didn't take. So I'm fascinated. He would pull up, he would say, okay, now if you go back to the, Hebrew, uh, the Greek word, this is what it means, and this is the past tense, and I mean, he would just go into all of this, and I, I didn't take it, so I was really intrigued, you know, by it, um, and I don't really, I don't know a whole lot about that. I just know that you need to go back to the original text to find out what they're actually saying, and that a lot of things have been mistranslated or translated, not mistranslated, like they weren't trying to mistranslate, but it, it didn't grab exactly what that word was saying in the original text. So now the weird thing is, is Jesus spoke Aramaic. So none of the texts were written in Aramaic that I know of, don't quote me on that. But I know that, um, you know, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, New Testament is written in Greek, and then somewhere there's Latin versions. Um, so, so there wasn't like a Bible written in Aramaic, but Jesus spoke Aramaic. And even the Aramaic that they have today is not the Aramaic that was spoken back then. So, you know, um, languages change over time quite a bit. I mean, you know, look at us, we're not speaking Elizabethan English, you know, it changes. So. The Bible was written so long ago, so in order to get the essence of what they are saying, what they were saying at that time, you have to go back and look at the words, how those words were used back then, and then try to translate it into now, and then not only the word, but then our culture. So it, it's very difficult. And people say that, um, you know, things were mistranslated, blah, blah. Not really, I mean, it just, it wasn't, these were not intentionally, at least that I think of, intentionally done, but how did I get on that kick? Anyway, so we talked about women prophets, and this is going to be part of my dissertation because I am doing women in the Bible. I don't know exactly. I, I have a title. I have, I, I have, you know, sort of I guess the essence of what I'm going to say, but I don't know exactly which direction I'm going to take yet. But one of the parts in my dissertation is going to be that this misconception about women being pastors and being ordained and that whole thing. And my professor this week said something that was very powerful about that. So I'm going to have to go talk to him or email him or something so he can elaborate for me for my dissertation. But some of the women prophets, I mean, are barely mentioned. Like there's, 
there's a lot of women in the Bible. I, I'm not really wanting to do the real prominent women because they've been written about so much, but more the ones that are kind of hidden in the Bible or might only be mentioned one word or two words or something. And um, I think it's going to be very powerful. So my mentor is going to work with me on the dissertation because we have studied the women of the Bible. We started studying that years and years and years ago. I mean, I have so many notes. I have I kept all my notes. Well, I think I kept all my notes, most of them anyway. Some may have gotten lost, but I've tried to keep them. And um, we were just going, to, we, were, we were looking at all the women in the Bible. Now, the thing that, that is so evident in every woman that Jesus was around, that Jesus touched, he always liberated women. So, uh, he never oppressed them. He never pushed them down. He never, I mean, he didn't do that to anyone, but especially when you're talking about women from that age is a really, really special thing. And so I don't think it, it's a Jesus thing or a God thing to oppress women in ministry. So my dissertation is going to be a lot about that. So I'm sure some of the prophets will come <laughs> into play in that. Okay, so show that. What else here? So we, um, this is Parker Palmer, Kathleen Cahillan, Eight Traditions on Calling. Um, that's just a thing that she had. Sorry, this isn't really in my notes that I was t I typed. This is just notes that he kind of gave us. So I didn't really, wasn't going to really go over this, but I could. Callings are discerned through relationships. And then um, he had given us this handout on eight traditions on calling. So he has it all mapped out here. Um, so here we have a Jewish perspective by Amy Eilberg. Here we have a Roman Catholic perspective by Kathleen Cahillan down here. A Protestant perspective by Douglas Shoreman, a perspective from the religion of Islam by John Kelsey, a Hindu perspective by Anantanand Rambakan, a perspective from Buddhism by Mark Uno, a Confucian and Taoist perspective by Mark Berkson. So he just has them all mapped out here. And then a secularist perspective by Edward Langer. And then we were talking about the Pauline view of calling. I remember talking about that in class. Images of vocation. Okay, so, and then I was taking, this is notes for my presentation. Okay, so we can move on from that. But then, um, so he did a lot on the Gospel of Luke. So he gave us this little handout on the Gospel of Luke. And so we have the preface, um, the first and second synchrosis, um, and then John's ministry, the, the opening, middle, and closing. So we have the Gospel of Luke. This is the third synchrosis. Um, this is Jesus' ministry here. Um, so he said, follow the flow organization of the narrative. Luke's Gospel. Uh, oh, we talked about the Sermon on the Plain, which I hadn't really heard a whole lot about. So there's the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain um, is how to respect economic and social differences. Um, so this is Jesus' opening minute, middle and closing ministry. I don't know how much I want to say about that. Oh, and this is scheduled for day four. So... Um, Putting ethical leadership studies in historical context, approaches to ethical leadership, examples of biblical and modern or contemporary moral leaders, case studies on ethical leadership, acquiring moral literacy, discussion of practical dimensions. This is just like one, two, three, four. Putting distributed leadership studies in historical context, learning distributed leadership from biblical examples, learning the ground rules of team leader leadership, and then blah, blah, blah. Paul talks about charismata. Yeah, I wish I could remember all of this, but epistemic injustice, epistemic violence, epistemicide. 
Okay, not remembering that, but this is the template for the questions on our calling. So that was a um, presentation we gave and, it, and it, all the questions like, who are you called to, from, for, and this is all questions. What are the particular context of your life? How do these contexts shape your sense of calling? What has God called you from? Where does calling lead? What gives you great joy? What are your gifts? Who needs your gifts? Who has been an agent of God's calling for you? So we were supposed to answer all of that in our presentation. And I have it written out somewhere. I, I guess I could do that another day. So, okay, so we left off last, last time on this trilogy of parables in Luke. I'm not remembering the third one. It's the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, and then I, I don't know if he was ta talked a whole lot about the third one. Okay, so all of them have words of compassion in them. He's saying Luke 10, 25. So let me just look that up real quick because um, that way I can read what he's talking about here. 10, oops, 25. Okay, so this is the Good Samaritan. So we don't, well, I guess we could read it, but so a parable is, is a story that Jesus is telling in order to get a point across. It's not a literal story that that happened that we know of. It's 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 a lesson that got that Jesus is is speaking out. So like when my kids ask me, is the Bible literal? I say yes, and they say, well, what about the parables? And I said, well, the, the parables are literal parables. They are parables. <laughs> I mean, what else do you want me to say? You know, yeah, they're they're not literal stories, but they are literal parables. I mean, anyway. Okay, so there's distinction between, I'm reading off my notes here now from class. So I've got my notes pulled up. My notes are all together because I was having, it was just, you know, you're just kind of typing fast and, uh, you know, you don't have time to, wow, I almost lost that whole thing there. You don't have time to like, you know, portion everything out and make, it's not an Excel spreadsheet, let's just say that. I, I, I hate Excel. <laughs> I, me and Excel do not mix, so I don't have charts and tables and all that. Okay, distinction between the parable frames and the parable proper. So the frames are the like the intro and the ending of the parable, and then the parable proper is you know just the parable itself. Um, and then our professor, he goes around and preaches around the country. He's also, we found out, is an editor of one of the Bibles. I, I'm not sure which Bible he is involved in, but he does that. He's written books. All, all of our professors have written books, I think, um, and have written things and done amazing things. So he said, I'm using the NRSV, UE, and we were all like, okay. So that's the new revised standard version, updated edition. So I, my mentor and I use the new American standard. So I'm not sure the difference between the new revised standard and the new American standard. I have to figure that out. So I don't know which one I was reading. Okay. I was reading about it here a, a minute ago. So the New Revised Standard Version is a translation of the Bible in it is in contemporary English, okay, but it has a desire to follow an older translation maxim, in quote, as literal as possible, as free as necessary, attempting to retain a word-for-word -word technique as much as possible. So the New American Standard, from what I have talked about with my mentor is the closest um, translation that we have from the closest to the original text. So it sounds like this one is trying to be close to the original text also. And he was going to the Greek a lot. So he knows Greek. So, um, so I guess he, he wants, he wants a version that's close to the original text. 
So that's what's hard. It's hard to have the exact original text because we are speaking English now that is a, you know, watered down English now. So, you know, it, it's really hard to translate word for, you know, um, I don't want to say word for word because you can't even do that really. So one day we'll, we'll, we'll do a video on the, on the translations and the versions and all that and kind of figure all that out. But it, there's that for now. <laughs> um, so right here I have, what is this? The Harper Collins. This is a, oh, I'm sitting here with a new revised standard version right now. <laughs> I didn't even know I had this, but um, because where do I keep this Bible? I don't know. I have it with my study books. So this is including apocryphal deuterocanonical books. Um, where did I even get this? Society of Biblical Literature. Okay. So this is a, it's a study Bible. So this is why I keep it with my, you know, my school books. I am way off track today. So, okay, so we need to go to Luke 37, verse 30, and I don't even have my, is it Luke 37? Is that right? I don't I have, I didn't think Luke had that many chapters. No, it doesn't. Okay, maybe it's Luke 10, verse 37. Yeah, okay. So, verse 37. He said, the one who showed him mercy, Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So the Good Samaritan, we all know about that, right? Okay. So the story is told in Luke 10, 29 through 37. A man going from Jerusalem to Jericho is attacked by robbers who strip him and beat him. A priest and a Levite pass by without helping him. But a Samaritan stops and cares for him, taking him to an inn where the Samaritan pay, pays for his care. Why is that especially uh, important here? Because uh, Samaritans do not mix with... So, Jamaritan, uh, Samaritans and Jews disliked each other, okay? So most Jews would not travel through Samaria. So it was a Samaritan from one hated group helping someone from the other hated group. That is why there's, you know, this story is, you know, that's part of the huge significance of it. Okay, so the word do. So he was going into Greek. I was getting so confused because I, I you know, I don't know Greek. Um, the word do, he said, is poieo. So Luke 10, 37 is a poieo word, but the sh showed mercy doesn't tell us that. The one having, so it's the one having shown mercy is what he's saying. So he went to Bible Hub. Poieo is, in, poieo improper is an emphasis on doing. Go and do likewise is also from the word poeo. How do we interpret? It's in between frames that emphasize doing. You could call it the parable of the one who showed compassion, depending on where you put the weight. We give names to help us digest the material. The titles could be hindering us from seeing what's in the text. Jesus saw the woman, got closer, then had compassion. I'm not sure what text he's talking about there because I didn't write it in there but he said you have to look at the Greek to see this so compassion has to do with becoming more proximate so I brought up the fact that if you show compassion then that means that you did something about the problem because compassion and empathy are different so you can have empathy and not do anything but compassion if you show compassion then you actually want to do something you, you put an action with it so um so that's what the samaritan did you know he not only helped the man but he took him to the inn paid for him and you know took care of him and the whole thing so i keep getting lost in where i am here okay so compassion has to do with becoming more proximate it is hard to be compassionate from a distance 
So then he talks about Martin Luther King, said something about this parable. We have to do something about the Jericho Road. So he's he, they're saying that the road that they're traveling is a problematic road. And so it could be that people were always getting beaten up on this road. And that's why some people were passing by because they were used to seeing that on that road. So he's saying that we need to do something about the Jericho Road. We can't expect a good Samaritan to come along every single day and find this person, blah, blah. But um, we need to do, you know, that that's a whole nother discussion. We need to fix this problem, you know. Um, okay, because we, we need to f do something about the Jericho Road because we may not always have a good Samaritan. Structural things in the fabric of society that need to be fixed. Chapter 15, two parables that come before the P.S. What was that? The lost sheep and the lost coin. Okay, I was thinking it was a lost coin. Um, something is lost, something is found, and someone rejoices. So let me go to 15 and see what it says here. 15 is the parable of the lost sheep. Then there's the parable of the lost coin, the prodigal, and his brother. Okay. Then a statement about he how heaven feels. Verse 7, these parables are in response to the grumblings of Jesus mixing with sinners. Think about those people the way heaven does. That's the response. How we treat each other should be based on heaven's regard for them. So let's read verse 7, because then he's reading verse 10. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then 10, just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Parable of the extravagant father is what they were saying they could call that because of what happens in the good, uh, um, um, the prodigal son. Um, okay, now we're on the prodigal son. Okay, um, so we know the prodigal son. He leaves home and goes and squanders his whole inheritance, blah, blah, and he comes home. And then the father has compassion on him when he sees him walking. And, and, um, okay, let me read this. The young man is on the way back. The father was filled with compassion, went to him. It's the same three items, seeing, compassion, and movement in proximity. So he's saying that in each of these parables, there is a proximate um, part. There's a there's a proximate piece. So you have to move move towards it. And so um, the father moves towards his son. And okay, so in Luke's understanding, those things work in tandem. You have to see them to perceive their plights. The father's treatment of the son tells us how to find compassion. Verse 20, he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. He tells the servants to bring a robe, sandals for his feet. It's about restoring a relationship. There is more at stake than just pity or empathy. So lost, found, rejoice. How does the father treat the eldest son? Verse 29, he doesn't even own him as a brother. So the brother of the, of the prodigal is upset because he says, you, you know, you're giving him all these accolades after he went and squandered everything. And I'm over here working for you every day and you've never, you know, you, you've never um, done these things for me. And so he's, he's upset, you know, um, and doesn't even, if you read the text, doesn't even recognize him as his brother at that moment because he had left. And now here he's back and his dad is giving him this royal treatment. So he says, this son of yours. <laughs> um, the father says, this brother of yours. So compassion is removing the elements that make someone less than the other. It puts, it puts us all on the human level. A parable of the lost, it could be called the parable of the lost sons. Um, one was lost away from home. One was lost at home. So... Okay, it could be called the father who sees. So he's saying that people just put these titles on these parables and you know, depending on if the title had changed, if someone had put a different title on it, we may see the parable differently. 
So if they had put the title, The Father Who Sees, then we would have seen it that way. Um, so then he goes back to the Good Samaritan and he's talking about how others passed him and did nothing. So um, we were talking about the Good Samaritan today in class um, and it was a kind of a different perspective than this. Uh, it, it, it's about the, the, the humanity of Jesus and the humanity of everyone and that um, we, you know, this is a different class. So the perspective is like so um, different and, um, you know, there, there are, there are hurting people everywhere and that we should, we should have eyes to see, we should have eyes to see the hurting and the uh, despairing people in the world and that there are things all around us that we could help with that we could do for other people at all times so this professor is saying if i would go to his notes i could see that but then i would get really confused um so let me see if i can find out what he says about okay so he's saying, what would Jesus do can be different based on interpretations. Um, he would be loving. It's not complicated. Love those who God places in your way to love. Um, and that's from the parable of the Good Samaritan. So that's kind of the view that I have is I, I, I know that I can't help everyone in the world. I mean, if, if I could, I would give to so many um other things I, I would give to so many things um i i truly believe in giving i think that you're never wrong to give god is always going to bless giving and um i try to give to some things that no one knows about um uh, one was an orphanage in africa that i was giving to um, no one knew that even my husband no one <laughs> no one knew i was giving to that orphanage but um and then you know sponsoring children whatever things that you can do i love the water wells that they build to bring you know water to you know wherever need, needs it villages in remote places and um I, I i truly believe in giving but but what he's saying here is is help and love those that god places in front of you so i know that i can't help everyone although i would I would do so much more. I would I would do it on a very large scale if I could, if I had the means, um, you know, for that orphanage. I would go and build them a building. I would do all these things, you know, if I could. Um, but here I'm, you know, just giving the little bit that I can give, and um, but it it always helps. And so, so yeah, you know, people say you can, you know, save the world. That's God's thing, but. If we are the hands and feet of God on the earth and God needs us to to use us to do the things that we need to do while we're here so we just take care of the things that God places in front of us you know I don't see the guy that's you know 20 miles down the road that that needs help I see the guy that I see that's right in front of me that needs help and those are the people that we need to help so we shouldn't be like you know the people that pass by the Good Samaritan and, um, you know, uh, were too busy or whatever to, to do anything because if God puts it so, so maybe they didn't have eyes to see. So that's one thing that we can pray, Lord, open my eyes to see the needs of those around me. And that is one thing that, um, I really believe in doing is that, um, because I, I'm very, um, uh, I, I kind of have like a serious demeanor and I, and I'm very focused like on what I'm focused on. And so sometimes I don't see the things around me. So I have to ask God to bring them to me, to show them to me or to, you know, open my eyes to see what the things that I need to do, the, the people that I need to help, the people that I, um, 
that he puts in my path. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. So God will put certain people in your path and that's not by mistake. Um, so, so he's, it's, it's, it's a hint, you know, you saw this, you do something, you know, you saw that, do something about that. Um, he didn't show you 50 other things, but he showed you that. And so that's how I try to live my life. Whatever God brings to me, puts in my path. Those are the things that I need to focus on and I need to do something about. So if, if I'm walking down the road and someone is beaten and hurt, I am not to turn a blind eye to that. So, um... I don't know if I did a real good job here at the Good Samaritan, but um, I think that that frees up a lot of people when you tell them to focus on the things that God puts in your path, because then we don't have to go out and save the whole world, because that's God's job. But we can, we can, we can have that effect on the things that are proximate to us, is what he was saying in our class that day. So um, anyway, well, there's my little speech on the Good Samaritan and I was going to show you my little chaplain chat cup you can't really see where it says chaplain chat in here because I I made these cups this is my logo that I had made that I, I paid for the logo so I can use it and then but then the chaplain chat is so when, when I made the cups I didn't I didn't really notice that that this was too dark down here and it's kind of hiding the words but, so I have my little Chaplain Chat mug. I ordered 10 of these. I made them and ordered them. So I'm gonna make some more and maybe make the logo a little bit bigger and try to make the words to where you can see them more. But I'm not trying to have like merch and stuff. I mean, maybe I will, but I just thought it'd be cool for at least me to have some stuff because um, that's my little, that's my little handle, Chaplain Chat. So, um, I want to in the future do some um, videos where I am just kind of chatting. You you come along with me while I am chatting about things. Show how you can go about your day, um, praying, and still internally be doing things um, for God, doing spiritual things internally um, while you're just doing ordinary things. You know. Um, you can be praying mopping the floor you can be praying doing the dishes you know you can be thinking about God and um so I want to do that and then there's this thing called the super chat where you go live um I I don't know if I'm at a place where I am gonna do lives yet but I could do a video called super chat <laughs> I don't know um uh or, or I could do like a chatty, I don't know, chatty Kathy, or I don't know, something. But um, I also am contemplating doing a video on this thing where I was betrayed because um, I think about that a lot. It, it hurts me a lot to know that this whole thing happened recently in my life, and I'm trying to decide how to deal with it and what to do about it. Um, I should speak out or not so I haven't said anything so far but it is something that is is really deeply affecting me and so I think I am gonna need to speak out about it uh, and I will do that uh, whenever whenever I get to it I guess <laughs> because I still have a lot of notes um, where are we at on our notes I don't think we got very far today either so this could be really long so we are just at, that's just day one. So I'm still not on day two yet. So um, we better shut this down. So uh, take care guys and I'll see you in the next video.